today we start lecture 9, the first lecture on constraint satisfaction problems. The instructional objectives of today's lecture is as follows. The students will be to the class of problems which we call constraint satisfaction problems. The students will learn how different types of constraints can be expressed in a formal manner. The students will learn how constraint satisfaction problems can be modeled as search problems and we they will also see how depth first search can be used with backtracking to solve these problems. We will also discuss how different heuristics can be used to make this search process more efficient. The students should be able to cast different types of constraint satisfaction problems as search problems in this framework. Many problems that occur in artificial intelligence as well as in many other areas of computer science are different types of constraint satisfaction problems. Many of you must be familiar with the satisfiability problem of the 3 sat. You are given a propositional formula and you want to know whether this formula is satisfiable. That is, does there exist an assignment of values to the different propositions so that the formula evaluates to true. So, satisfiability problem is a type of constraint satisfaction problem. Every variable can take exactly one value true or false and the formula must evaluate to true. So, if you have a formula which is a conjunction of different clauses then each of these different clauses must be individually true for the entire formula to be true. Different types of scheduling problem like the timetabling problem, different types of job shop scheduling, they can also be looked upon as constraint satisfaction problems. There can be different constraints among the different jobs. For example, job 1 may need to precede job 5. So, the precedence relationships among the jobs impose uh, constraints among these jobs. Other types of constraints can also be imposed. For example, in uh, the timetabling problem, our objective is we are given a list of classrooms, a list of courses a list of teachers and students taking the courses. Our objective is to schedule courses to time slots and to classrooms so that at any time slot not more than one class can be scheduled at a classroom at a given time slot. A teacher at the same time slot cannot be teaching two courses. A student at the same time slot cannot be taking two courses. So, these are the different types of constraints in the timetabling problem. There are other problems like supply chain management, the graph coloring problem which we will talk about in a little bit more detail today. Then there is constraint satisfaction arising in machine vision, in the age detection, walls filtering and then different types of puzzles can also be looked upon as constraint satisfaction problems. Many of you have worked on crossword puzzles. You have to, you, ha you are given a rectangular grid and you have to fill up words row wise and column wise, right. And there are constraints because several words may share a common letter. So, formally a constraint satisfaction problem consists of a set of variables x. So,
So, these are the variables x. For each variable x i belonging to x, x i the variable x i can take its values from a domain d i. d i is a finite set of possible values. So, we assume today that the domain of every variable is discrete and finite. We are also given a set of constraints restricting tuples of values. For example, we can have binary constraints. We may say that x5 and x7 cannot take the same value. So, this is an example of a binary constraint or we can say that the value of xi must be numerically less than the value of the variable xj. So, these are binary constraints. Unary constraints means constraints involving a single variable. We may say that xi must take values which are only odd integers. So, we can have unary constraints, we can have binary constraints, we may even have constraints involving more than two variables. However, we will discuss constraints mainly involving two variables or binary constraints in today's class and we will later discuss how other types of constraints can be formulated in this term. So, if the constraints concern only pairs of values, we have a binary constraint satisfaction problem. A solution to a constraint satisfaction problem is an assignment of a value to each of the variables x i. So, each variable x i can take values from its domain d i and assignment of values to each of these variables which does not violate any of the constraints is a solution of the constraint satisfaction problem. Let us look at an example of a graph coloring problem or a map coloring problem. Uh, we had I think we had occasion to discuss this problem when we discussed search. So, here we have a map which consists of four regions V 1, V 2, V 3 and V 4 and we are given three colors. Let us say the colors are red, green and blue and we want to know can you assign regions to colors such that two adjacent regions cannot have the same color. So, this problem is also called the map coloring problem because suppose you have a map, you have different countries and you want to color the countries using colors such that two adjacent countries always have different colors. A related problem is the graph coloring problem. In fact, a map coloring problem can be transformed to an instance of a graph coloring problem involving a planar graph. So, if we look back at the previous slide, we see that V 1 is adjacent to V 2, V 3 and V 4. V 2 is adjacent to V 1 and V 3, V 3 is adjacent to V 2, V 1 and V 4, V 4 is adjacent to V 1 and V 3. We can model V 1, V 2, V 3, V 4 as the vertices of the graph and we have an edge between two nodes if V 1 is adjacent to V 2. So, we have an instance of a graph coloring problem where we want to assign colors to the vertices of the graph such that two adjacent vertices do not have the same color. So, we have a variable for each node and the domain for each of the variables is the colors red, green and blue. V 1 can be red, green or blue, V 2 can be red, green or blue, V 3 can be red, green or blue, V 4 can be red, green or blue and so on. So, the, there is a constraint on each edge 
all constraints are of the form that the color on one end point of this edge should be different from the color at the other end point of this edge. So, these two nodes must be V 1 and V 4 must have different colors, V 1 and V 2 must have different colors, V 2 and V 4 must have different colors and so on. The solution to this problem gives a coloring of the vertices. This is an example of a binary CSP. Similarly, the satisfiability problem, the satisfiability problem of propositional formula can be also looked upon as a constraint satisfaction problem. So, we have a variable uh, in the satisfiability problem in the formula we have different variables corresponding to each of these variables of the variable in the CSP problem. The domain of each of the variables is either true or false, a proposition can be either true or false. The constraint corresponds to each clause. We disallow tuples which falsifies the clause. So, if we have a clause, let us say we have a clause uh, x 1 or x 2 bar. So, we cannot have the situation where x 1 is 0 and x 2 is 1. If x 1 is 0 and x 2 is 1, then this clause will not be satisfiable and therefore, if we have a conjunction of clauses, the entire conjunction cannot be satisfiable. So, here the constraints are we cannot have for each clause, we must disallow those tuples such that the clause is falsified. If we have a clause x 1 bar or x 4 or x 5, we cannot have the situation that x 1 is uh, true, x 4 is false and x 5 is false. So, this is an example, SAT is an example of a constraint satisfaction problem. However, the general satisfiability problem is not a binary CSP, right? A clause may have k variables. So, the constraints involve a set of k variables. Thirdly, let us look at the n quints problem, which we also discussed earlier. We are given a chess board, 8 by 8 chess board, and we have to place 8 queens in the chess board, so that no two queens attack each other. So, we can formulate this problem in this way. We have 8 variables representing the positions of the 8 queens. You see, two queens cannot be in the same row. So, let us say that x 1 is the queen in the first row, x 2 is the queen in the second row, x 3 is the queen in the third row. There has to be exactly one queen per row. So, let x 1 denote the position of the queen, that is the column position of the queen in the first row. x 2 denote the column position of the second queen in the second row. Now, because no two queens attack each other, x i has the domain of x i is 1, 2, 3, 4 up to 8 for each position in the row. The constraints are for any two, for any different i and j, x i should not be equal to x j because we cannot have two queens in the same column, right. So, each of these variables must have a different value. Also, two queens cannot be in the same column. So, x i minus x j cannot be equal to i minus j or x and x j minus x i cannot be equal to i minus j. That is the queens cannot be either in the right diagonal or in the left diagonal. So, these are the constraints for the n queens problem or its variation the 8 queens problem. And uh, this is the same uh, statement that we have seen. So, a CSP to summarize consists of a set of variables x consisting of x 1, x 2 up to x n. Each variable x i has a domain d i from which it takes values. d i is a finite set of possible values. We have a set of constraints restricting the tuples of values. 
and a solution is an assignment of a value in di to each variable xi such that every constraint is satisfied. So, let us formally define what we mean by constraints. A constraint c i j k dot 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 involving the variables x i, x j, x k and etcetera. So, a constraint can involve a single variable, it is called a unary constraint. A unary constraint basically restricts the domain. We can have binary constraints which involve two variables, ternary constraints involving three variables, kre constraints in general involving k variables. So, a constraint c i j k dot 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 involves the variables x i, x j, x k etcetera. It is any subset of combinations of values from the domains of these variables x i, x j, x k which are allowed. That is this constraint specifies that a subset of the Cartesian product of d i, d j and d k are allowed sets. So, there are different ways in which we can express such constraints. We can specify which are the valid tuples. For example, we can say that suppose d 1 and d 2 are same and they are 1, 2 and 3. Then let us say that we say that the valid tuples are 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2. The rest of the tuples are invalid. Or we can specify constraints like x 1 is not equal to x 2 or constraints like x 1 less than x 2 or x 1 equal to x 2 plus 1 and so on. So, there are different ways in which constraints can be expressed. Another example, uh, crypt arithmetic is a type of puzzle. Uh, we have every letter standing for a digit and every letter stands for a different digit. We have to find an assignment of letters to digits such that a given arithmetic formula is correct. For example, we have this formula send plus more equal to money and the variables are d e m n o r s y and the domains of these variables are or rather domains for d e n o r y are 0 to 9 any of the digits from 0 to 9. S, M and M, S and M cannot be 0. So, S and M must have values from 1 to 9 and each of these variables must have different value. We want to know if there is a solution to this problem. That is, is there an assignment of values to each of these variables such that this arithmetic expression is correct. So, how do we specify the constraint for this script arithmetic problem? We can write one long constraint for the sum 1000 into s plus 100 times e plus 10 times n plus d plus 1000 times m plus 100 times o plus 10 times r plus e equal to 10,000 m plus 1000 o plus 100 n plus 10 e plus 1. Okay. So, this is the sum constraint, but there are other constraints. We have to specify that s is not equal to e, s is not equal to o, s is not equal to r, s is not equal to n, m is not equal to o and so on. Or we can express it as a single constraint on all the variables. We can say that the values of each of these variables must be different by saying all different d, e, m, n, o, r, s, y. These two constraints, the sum constraint and this constraint together precisely characterize this problem. Now, let us see uh, that constraint satisfaction problems can be looked upon as search problems. It is a kind of search in which a state is not indivisible. A state in these problems, we will look at the formulation, a state consists of assignments of values to the different variables. So, state is factorized into the states of the different variables inside the state. The search involves finding an assignment of values to these variables, finding that state 
which corresponds to a particular assignment of values to this variables. So, these constraints provide the structure to the state space and we will discuss that backtracking algorithms which can be very well done with depth per search work uh, can work well for this problem and we can use other methods along with backtracking including constraint propagation, variable ordering and different pre-processing steps to make the search more efficient. Now, let us see how CSP can be looked upon as a search problem. The states are the nodes in the graph, the operators are the arcs between the nodes and then we have to know what are the initial state and what are the goal state. For example, suppose we take this problem, the n queens problem for n equal to 4 and for this problem, the initial state is the state where none of the variables assign values. That is, we have not placed any queens in the board, right. The neighbors are the cases where the first queen is assigned. The first queen can be assigned uh, either here or here or here or here. So, let us say the first queen corresponds to the first column. The first queen can be assigned 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. If the first queen is assigned 2, the second queen cannot be assigned, sorry, if the first queen is assigned 1, the second queen cannot be assigned 1 because the constraint is violated, two queens cannot be in the same row. The first queen cannot be assigned 2 because the diagonal constraint will be violated. So, the first queen can be in, sorry. If the first queen is in 1, the second queen can be in 3 or 4. If the second queen is in 3, the third queen cannot be in 1 or 3. It cannot be in 2 or 4 because diagonal constraints will be violated. So, after we have placed the first queen here and the second queen here, we cannot place the third queen anywhere, right. If we cannot place the third queen anywhere, Wherever we place the fourth queen, the problem cannot be satisfied because the constraint of third queen is violated. So, this is a, uh, this path is fruitless. So, we can terminate search below this, okay. Then we can look at this sibling where the first queen is in first row, second queen is in fourth row. Now, the third queen can be placed neither in 1 nor in 4 nor in 3, but only in 2. So, we place the third queen in 3 and then we have to see whether we can put place the fourth queen anywhere. If you place the third queen in 2, then the fourth queen cannot be placed in 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. So, we have to prune search below this knot, right. Now, when we prune search below this knot, we have to backtrack and find out the next place where we should explore the state space. So, as you can see, the nature of this search space is such that we can start from the root node and we can do a depth per search whenever we uh, generate successes, we only generate those successes that do not violate any constraints. If a constraint is violated at a node, then further assignment of values to the other variables cannot help resolve that constraint. So, exploring that region of the search tree is fruitless. Hmm? So, if a constraint is violated, we can abandon that path. If we reach a node so that we cannot place some variable, the next variable at any of the, we cannot assign any value to the one of the variables, then we can prune that portion of the search tree and we backtrack to our next choice point. So, depth for search with backtracking seems to be a good solution to such search problems.
Now, as we mentioned that binary CSPs are the special types of constraint satisfaction problem which involve constraints between two variables. So, if we have suppose this is an assignment of values to variables x i is assigned a i x j is assigned a j and they are consistent with a set of variables x m to x n if and only if there exists a tuple of values a m up to a n such that x i a i x i assigned to a i x j assigned to a j x m assigned to a m x n assigned to a n this whole thing is consistent. So, when we in the search tree a particular node in the middle of the search tree denotes a partial assignment of values to the variables. This partial assignment can be explored further only if there is a full assignment of values to all the variables which includes this partial assignment and which satisfies all the constraints. Okay. We will use this property later to see where we can prune the search space even further. So, when we have a constraint uh, satisfaction problem, we can look upon this as a search problem and depth first search seems to be a very nice, very good technique to solve such search problems. But if we are able to propagate constraints, then we can improve the efficiency of the search. And we will discuss today and the next class different ways of constraint propagation, including forward checking and maintenance of arc consistency. So, the backtracking framework that we will use for constraint satisfaction problem basically involves that consistency check is performed in the order in which the variables are instantiated. Whenever we instantiate a variable, we may check its consistency with respect to the variables that we have already assigned. If the consistency check fails at a particular point, we look at the next possible value of the current variable. If there are no more values for this variable, there are no values of the variables which are consistent with the previous assignments, then we backtrack to the most recent choice point. So, this is the sense of chronological backtracking, which is the basic framework of search for CSPs. So, let us look at the depth first search algorithm for solving CSPs. The initial state is the empty assignment that is none of the variables are assigned all variables are unassigned the goal in the goal state all the variables will be assigned values from their domain and all the constraints must be satisfied the successor function assigns a value to any variable which is as yet unassigned such that this assignment does not violate any constraints with respect to what has already been assigned. All CSP search algorithms generate successors by considering possible assignments for only a single variable at each node in the search tree. You see, when we start from the initial node where all the variables are unassigned, there are n candidate variables. Each of them can take different values. So, there are potentially many successors of the first node. So, what we do is instead of trying all these values at once, we pick one of the variables. We will later see how we can effectively pick a good variable to try next, but we pick one of the variables and for that variable we try to assign the different possible values. That is why how we model the search tree for CSPs. The goal test when the assignment is complete and by the way in which we have assigned, we have made sure that no constraints are violated. So, if we have been able to get a complete assignment to all the variables, so that no constraints are violated, we have reached the goal state. 
So, if there are n variables, typically if we get to a node which is at depth n, then we have found a solution to the CSP. Now, in constraint satisfaction problem, there may be different objectives. Your objective may be to find one solution, any one solution or all solutions. If you want to find all solutions, you must explore the entire tree until uh, save except those where you have pruned the search. If you want to find only one solution, you stop as soon as you get a solution. If there is no solution, you have to again explore the entire tree to rule out all possibilities. What is the path cost? Actually, path cost is not very important. So, we can say that path, uh, the cost is 1 for every step. Okay. So, so, assigning n variables will take a cost of n. So, this algorithm can be recursively formed because we are basically using depth first search, we can have a recursive formulation of this algorithm. So, this is a simple recursive uh, function which captures this basic algorithm. Recurse assignment CSP. If the assignment is complete, that is all variables assign values, then we return the current assignment as the solution. Otherwise, we select an unassigned variable. Okay. How do we select? We can simply select the next one in the order or we can select smartly, which we will see later. But we select one unassigned variable and for each value in the domain of the variable, so, assuming that we order the possible values that the variable can take in a particular order, one by one we consider the different values or we can be smarter and we can decide in what order we should test the values so that our search effort is minimized. In any case, for a given order, we select the values, we take up values one by one. And if that assignment of that value to this variable is consistent, we add this variable value tuple to the assignment and we call recurse again with this new assignment. If recurse succeeds, then we return the assignment. Otherwise, if this recurse does not succeed, we remove variable value, we remove this assignment and try the next choice. If we have not been able to succeed, then we return failure. If none of these assignments are successful, then we return failure. So, this is a simple recursive structure of the basic DFS problem for uh, backtracking which solves the CSP. Now, if we want to consider the efficiency of the CSP problem, there are various things that we can consider. Which variable should we assign next? Among the unassigned variables so far, which variable should we pick next? And then for a given choice of variable, in what order should the values of the variables be tried? Secondly, how does the assignment to the current variable influence the assignment for other unassigned variables? Okay. So, if the current variable is given a certain assignment, that will affect the assignment of values to the other variables because the constraints that are imposed by this current assignment is carried over to the other variables, it cons further constraints other variables including the currently unassigned variables. So, we may have to consider this effect in deciding which variable or which variable value pair we will try next. Thirdly, when a path fails, suppose at particular point there is a failure, there is a inconsistency. Can the search avoid repeating this failure in subsequent paths? So, these are the issues that we will discuss. So, some of these issues we will discuss today in order to see how we can try to make this search more efficient.
You see, we have discussed a heuristic search, different types of heuristics. In CSV, we do not normally use heuristics. Instead, we try to see how these uh, issues can be tackled. And these issues have the effect of reducing, of improving search efficiency. So first, let us uh, take up the issue of variable ordering. When we want to select the next unassigned variable, we can use the following heuristic, which is called the minimum remaining value heuristic, or which is also called the most constrained variable heuristic, which states choose the variable with the fewest legal values. You see, every variable has a domain to start with. Now, when we assign values to some of the variables, the domain of the other variables get restricted. Suppose V1 and V2 are adjacent in the graph coloring problem. If I assign V1 to red, V2 could initially be either red or green or blue. But if V1 is assigned red and V2 is adjacent to V1, V2 cannot be red. So V2 must be either green or blue. V2 is also adjacent to V3 and V3 is green, then V2 also cannot be green. So V2 cannot be red or green. It has to be only blue, if at all. So the domain of V2 has got restricted. Now, after we have given, made partial assignment to some of the variables, we look at the remaining variables and their valid domain with respect to the current assignment. We choose that variable whose domain is smallest. Suppose V2 has only one value in its domain, blue. So we can just assign V2 to blue. That's the only choice, right? So we choose the variable which has the least number of legal values. In the beginning, suppose when we have not uh, assigned any variable to any value, we can use another heuristic which is called the degree heuristic. In the degree heuristic, we select the variable which is involved in the largest number of constraints with other unassigned variables. You see, we have to, we select variables one by one, but finally we have to select all the variables. If we choose to select a variable so that it constrains severely the domains of the other unassigned variables, it can help to reduce future search. So the degree heuristic is useful, especially in the beginning. Or in cases, even though the minimum remaining value heuristic is a very good heuristic and we usually try it first, but we can use the degree heuristic to resolve ties between two variables which has the same uh, importance according to this factor, according to the MRV heuristic. So minimum remaining value heuristic or the most constrained variable heuristic is a heuristic which is used for choosing the next variable to assign. And it is very effective. If you run a different instances of constraint satisfaction problem, you can test the effectiveness of this heuristic. The degree heuristic is also useful and is often used to break ties. Next, uh, once we have picked which variable to try, let us consider the order in which we will consider the values, the uh, values that we will assign to the heuristic. Here, the heuristic is, uh, that is used is called the least constraining value heuristic. We prefer to first try that value that rules out the fewest choices for the neighboring variables in the constraint graph. So we will choose the values one by one. So first time when we choose a value, and suppose our objective is to find one solution to the CSP problem, then we will be very happy if we quickly reach a solution because after that we can stop our search. Of course, in those cases where we want all the solutions or in those cases where a solution does not exist and we have to 
look through the entire search space, the order in which we choose the values really do not matter because we have to go through the entire search space. But if we are interested in getting only a one or a few satisfying solutions, then we try to choose that value for which there is a greater hope that a solution will be found. So we choose that value which is least constraining, that is which rules out the fewest choices for the remaining variables or at least the neighboring variables in the constraint graph. Secondly, we will talk about it uh, very briefly. We have uh, just mentioned that uh, in C for CSP problems, we do depth first search and whenever we find an inconsistency, we backtrack. Whenever the inconsistencies arise because the current assignment of variable value does not agree with the previous assignment. In those cases, we backtrack. It is possible to take this effort one step further. Whenever we assign a value to a variable, we propagate constraints to the future variables, to the unassigned variables. And then if we notice that other variables, there is some variable as a result of the current assignment, there is a variable whose domain becomes null. That means there is another variable which is not consistent with the current partial assignment. If we can discover that, we can tardiness our search. This can be achieved by various types of constraint propagation. There are many algorithms which do constraint propagation to different degrees. We will discuss briefly two types of algorithm, forward checking and our consistency. Today, we will talk a little bit about forward checking and in the next class we will discuss some arc consistency algorithms. So forward checking is the simplest type of constraint propagation. The idea is simple. When I assign a value to a variable and when we, if we find that it is inconsistent with some other variable, that another variable cannot take any valid value for the current assignment, then we can terminate the search at this point. So this is the idea of the algorithm. So whenever we assign a value to a variable, we use that assignment to restrict the domains of the unassigned variables. And if we find that some other future variable, its domain becomes null, we terminate the search at this point. This is the idea of forward checking. And how do we carry out forward checking? We, for, with every variable, we keep its current valid domain. So whenever we assign a variable to a value, we update the, the domains of the other variables. So we use a data structure. The data structure is for every variable xi, we maintain its current domain cdi. Initially cdi is equal to the whole domain of the variable with cdi equal to di to start with. When we set variable xj equal to particular value v, we remove xi equal to u from the domain of xi. If some constraint is not consistent with both xj equal to v and xi equal to u. If x, my current assignment is xj equal to v, xi is an unassigned variable and there u is one of the values in its domain. But if xi equal to u and xj equal to v violate some constraints, then we remove u from the domain of xi. And in this way, if we find that a particular variable xi has its current domain cdi to be null, then we can stop search beyond the current point. Now let us just briefly discuss how constraint propagation is used in the graph coloring problem. 
So, in a graph coloring problem, we start with all the nodes unassigned, all the nodes unassigned, then we pick a node, assign it a color, okay. Assign it possible colors from what its current domain is. After we instantiate a node with the color, we propagate the color. And how do we propagate the color? We remove the color, suppose we have colored the current node red. We remove le red from the current domain of all its uninstantiated neighbors. If any of these neighbors by this process, if any of these neighbors domains become empty, then we backtrack. Now for each n in these neighbors, if n previously had two or more available colors, but now has only one color. Suppose there is a neighbor, earlier its domain CDI had two or more colors, but as a result of this constraint propagation, XI has only one valid color left in the domain. Now I can use this color to propagate constraints further. So I can take N, assign N that color because that is the only color that N can be assigned and propagate this constraint so that its neighbors get affected. So, we call propagate color N C. So, this is the code for uh, propagating constraints for the graph coloring problem. Whenever we assign a node, node, the color, color, we call propagate color node color. And propagate color node color has these three steps. First, remove color from all of available lists of the uninstantiated neighbors of node. If any of these neighbors gets the empty set, then this is an inconsistent situation, so we backtrack. Now, for we look at these neighbors. If any of these neighbors is in the situation where earlier its current domain had two or more colors, but as a result of this um, propagation, currently that node N has only one color C in its domain, in its current domain, then we call propagate color N C, okay. So, this is the algorithm for propagating constraints in a graph coloring, in the graph coloring problem. So, let us uh, look at one more example of forward checking. We have variables x and y. The domains of x and y are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The constraints is that x is less than y minus 1. So, initially the current domain of both x and y are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Suppose we set x equal to 2, then y has to be greater than equal to x plus 1. So, y has to be can only be either 4 or 5. So, C D y becomes 4, 5. Now, if we set x equal to 4, then C D y becomes now because there is no value in its domain. So, if we set x equal to 4, we have to retract this choice and then backtrack. Now, so we come to the end of today's lecture. So, I will end this lecture by setting two questions for you to consider answering and then we will discuss uh, these in the next class. Question number 1, give precise formulations for the following problem as a constraint satisfaction problem. This is the class timetabling problem. You are given a situation where there is a number of teachers and a given number of classrooms. You have a list of classes that have to be offered or list of sorry list of courses that have to be offered and you are also given a list of time slots for these courses. Each teacher has a set of classes which the teacher can teach. Now your objective is to schedule the classes, schedule the courses to time slots, to teachers, to classrooms and so on. So, you have to consider the different constraints in this problem and pose it as a constraint satisfaction problem and indicate how you will go about solving such problems. Question number 2. 
question 2 you are given the following crypt arithmetic problem that we discussed send plus more equal to money and as I have explained your job is to assign digits to S E N D N so each of these characters so so that each of these characters correspond to unique digits M and S cannot be 0 and this arithmetic relation is satisfied. Now you have to we have already seen how we can pose this as a constraint satisfaction problem. Your job is firstly to solve this problem on paper using backtracking and for a particular ordering of the variables and the values. You choose a particular ordering of the variables and given with that particular ordering you draw the DFS tree and indicate where backtracking will occur. The second part to this question you have to do this problem again but this time you have to use the minimum remaining variable heuristic to choose which variable you should consider next. So use the minimum remaining variable heuristic and check if it has any effect on pruning of the search tree for this particular problem. The third part to this question you use forward checking of the type that we discussed today. We use constraint propagation or forward checking on this problem and see how you can work on it. Okay. So this brings us to the end of today's class. Thank you.